I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant, for I crossed over um, this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother and the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. Two hundred female goats and twenty male goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, thirty milk camels with their uh, colts, forty cows and ten bulls, ten female donkeys and ten foals. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some dis distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one, saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, uh, they are your servant, Jacob's. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed in uh, the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face, perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jebuk. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask me about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his uh, hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us, and um, we pray that as we sang in the songs that we come before you with humility, and we say, change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. Lord, help us realize that we, uh, we can't do this alone. We can't change our hearts, no matter what programs we sign up for or what books we read. But we need your divine power. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to move in our heart and to change us and to shape us, that he may work in us and make us into the image of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you, O Holy Spirit, would move in our midst, would work in our hearts, would change our hearts, and would just tell us about Jesus and make us fall in love with you, God. We pray for soft hearts. We pray that you would minister to us through these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 32. So... Um, What is the story about who? Who's the main person of the story? Jacob. Good. Thank you, Danny. 
I'm glad someone is paying attention. So let's talk about Jacob. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Does that sound pretty good? Yeah, really good. I mean, he's going. Imagine you're walking on your way, and who gets to meet you? Angels. I mean, who would sign up? I'm signing up. It's pretty amazing. But the thing is, what, did this, what just happened, you know? He just left a guy named Laban. Okay, so to make sure you guys are awake and to check, do a quick knowledge check, who's Laban to Jacob? Father-in-law. So he's his father-in-law, and he just left Laban. Does anyone know what just happened in chapter 31 between Jacob and Laban? Was it a friendly meeting? No. What was happening? Well, no, that was before, but like this time, you're right. He gave him, he tricked him. He gave him his oldest daughter. He wanted his youngest daughter, his younger one. But um, he was, I'll tell you really quickly, he was chasing him. And they weren't, you know, playing hide and seek. He was chasing him. He wanted to hurt him because he left without telling him. And uh, so finally, God intervenes, which we, if we have some time, I might get back to that. God intervenes and saves Jacob, and then whew, he walks out of that meeting. It's a very rough meeting. His life could have ended. He could have been seriously hurt. And then right when he walks out of that, so Jacob went on his way, and he was so glad to go on his way. And guess what happened? And the angels of God met him. And this is God telling Jacob, listen, Jacob, this journey you're on, this life journey of yours, I'm watching over you. I am walking with you. I am here to protect you. And this is one of the ministries of angels. Our topic is not angels. Our topic is Jacob. But one of the ministries of angels is they watch over us. They protect us. They've, there's many, many, you know, it'll be one of those things that part of heaven, you know, when we realize the real function of angels and how they were intervened for us without us knowing, it's going to be like, Amazing stuff. So one of them is, is they met him. But not just that. When Jacob saw them, so here it's uh, singular or plural? How many angels were there? Plural. A lot, right? So, so when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So it's what? It's a huge, a camp is not like, you, it's not one, it's not five, it's not ten. It's a lot of angels. So this is God's camp, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Mahanaim means double camp. So there's so many angels that it's like two camps watching over Jacob and taking care of him. And here, what is God's message that he's trying to say? Jacob just potentially lost his life, and he didn't. He walked away peacefully with knowing for sure that God is with him, and God protected him. And then he meets not an angel, but he meets not angels. He doesn't even meet a camp of angels, but he meets Mahanaim, two camps of angels watching over him. So if you are in Jacob's shoes, you almost lost your life, and the only reason you didn't lose it is because you know for sure God is the one that saved you and preserved you. How are you feeling? Feeling good. Do you feel safe? Yes. Do you feel like you could trust God? Yes. Do you feel like you're on cloud nine with the Lord? Yes. But look at this crazy thing. I want to... This... If we really focus on this story, I think we'll find out that this story is our story many times. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So here he's about to go meet who? His brother, what's his name? Esau. And how's that relationship? Not good. Why? What's going on? Huh? His story is, so what? I mean, like, it's a big deal. Like, was it a big deal to Esau? Yeah? How? Huh? No, no, I know, but was, like, did it bother Esau? I mean, he, did he sell it 
fair and square? Did, 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 did Jacob get it from Esau fair and square or no? No? What? Yeah? No? Yeah? No? What? The birthright. Well, the birthright gives you what? The blessing. How did he, did he get the birthright fair and square? No? Yeah? No? Yeah? Yeah? No? 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 Yeah? 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 No? Let me know when you guys figure it out. <laughs> yes, did he, was he mean about it? I didn't ask you, was it mean? I said, did he get it fair and square? Okay, by the way, who's older? By how much? Minutes. They're twins. Do you ever talk about twins like who's older? Do you ever ask twins who's older? Really? You guys are weird. <laughs> I am two minutes older. Thank you very much. I'm seven minutes older. So he feels, I mean, imagine this, okay? You get a blessing from God, and it's, and it's supposed to go to the oldest one, and you happen to be a twin. I mean, and the younger twin, like, you know, by a minute or two. That's just wrong. You feel like, Lord, why? Why did you do this? You know? And so he, feel, he felt like, let me get my blessing. So he found his brother, and he knows his brother's weakness. His brother likes food, and his brother was hungry. He says, I'm going to die. He says, well, I have food. He's like, give me some of that. He's like, oh. Pay up. What do you want? I want the blessing. I want the firstborn right. And Esau sold it to him or not? Yeah. Did he sign the contract or not? Yes, okay, I mean, it's not, okay, but it's a verbal contract. He signed the verbal contract. He was completely willing, and he was in his right state of mind. When he gave it up, he has it fair and square. Now, honestly, who's really the bad guy? When Isaac asked Esau to go get some food and bring it back so he could bless him, what should have Esau done if he was a real gentleman? He should have said, sorry, Dad, I'll get you the food, but you need to bless Jacob because I sold it. And I don't really care for that stuff. Did he do that? No. So, but Jacob went along with his mom's idea. It's actually the mom was the conniving one in that story. But anyways, so he goes along with it. He was scared. He's like, I'm afraid. What if God finds out? And I'm, that blessing could turn into a curse. I'm scared. She's like, oh, they got this. I got discovered. He's like, I smell different than my brother. She's like, I can make you smell like your brother. I feel different than my brother. He's, she's like, I can make you feel like your brother. And she went along, and he's like, okay, mom. And even his dad felt like something is off here. But when he smelled him, when he felt him, he's like, this is Esau. So, but the, true, the truth of the matter is, Jacob got the blessing, and Esau didn't. Now, when Esau came back, he was upset. Why, why did, who was the one that came up with the idea that Jacob should leave? His mom. Why? He already stole it. I'm going to quit. He wanted to kill his brother. Can brothers kill brothers? Yes. Has it ever happened? In, can, like, is there any proof that Cain and Abel? So is he, can he do it? Yeah. And I mean, if you really like, okay, if you wanted to watch those two fight, okay, let me tell you their lifestyle, okay? One hunts. The other one likes to carry the sheep with mommy <laughs> and cooks with mommy. Who are you? <laughs> it's not even like a fair thing. That, he's dead. So his mom sends him away. Now, I want you to know that 20 years had just passed right now from when his brother wanted to kill him. And now he is coming to meet Esau. So Genesis 32, verse 3, Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Do you think it was a good idea for Jacob to send messengers before him to meet Esau before Jacob meets Esau? Good idea or no? Yeah. Okay, who thinks it's a good idea? Who thinks it's a bad idea? Good, I agree. It's a good idea. He sent him there, someone, right? So, and he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. 
I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Okay, so we agree that him sending messengers is a good idea. Do we, uh, what do you think of the message he's saying? Good one or bad one? Huh? Raise your hand if it's good. Raise your hand if it's bad. Raise your hand if it's so so. <laughs> It's a terrible message. He's the one that got the blessing and he's doing exactly, and we'll go to that blessing hopefully later if we have time. But he's doing exactly the opposite of what the blessing that he was blessed with was. So here he says that he commanded them saying, speak thus to my Lord Esau. You know what the blessing was? Who was Lord over who? It was actually specifically mentioned that you will be Lord over multiple people, including your brother. You are Lord over him, and this is not humility, that what he is doing. So here he says, speak thus to my Lord Esau. So here this is his message to the people that are with him. He is not living with the power that he should be living as a believer. He's not living according to the calling by which he was called. He's not living according to his, his position in Christ. He's not living according to that place where he's at. And he's making himself like a sinner. He says, speak thus to my Lord Esau. So here he's, he is telling those people in front of him that to me he is Lord. Even the Lord made you Lord over him. So that's mistake number one. Thus your servant Jacob says. So here not only is he Lord and I am servant. Here that's him confessing to his people that I am weak. I can't live a strong Christian life. I can only live this weak life that I'm living. I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I've been living with Laban for 20 years. My father-in-law. Now I'm back. Want you to know something about me? I'm rich. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks. And male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord, again he's saying, that I may find favor in your sight. I want your approval. I want you to be pleased with me. Let me put it in context. Jacob is a believer. He has the promise of God. God just saved him, as we talked in the beginning, just saved him from Laban, and it was completely God intervention. Right after that, he is in the presence of God. He sees angels, not just angels. He sees two camps of angels. And all of that blessing goes down the drain the moment he realizes something. Now he has to meet his past. He has to go back to something he did 20 years ago. And he has to face it. And he turns into a coward. He turns into a really weak man. And he takes away the power that God has given him. The blessings that God has given him. And he turns into this guy who says, I am, you are my Lord. I am your servant. Listen, I'm rich, okay? How much can I buy you with? Verse 6. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, so they went there and they came back. We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you. So far sounds good or no? Yeah, right? Uh, and 400 men are with him. Does it still sound so good? Not so good, because here his brother is coming with how many people? 400, not people, but 400 what? Men. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He says, oh man. I am what? He's not afraid. He's greatly afraid. But he's not just greatly afraid. He's also distressed. He's greatly distressed. He's like, I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. He said, now I have to think in case something bad happens, I have to have an escape plan. 
And he tells us what his plan was. So he split them into two companies. And then he said, and he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. So he has two companies. Company number one is the first company to meet Esau. And then company number two is behind. And then if company number one gets attacked, what does company number two do? Runs away and flees. And here, I don't know if you ever feel this in your life or not. You feel like, you know, I go, I, I meet the Lord, I hear the Lord, whether I hear him through a message, through a meeting, through songs, through prayer, and I feel here. And then I face life, and it's as if I heard nothing. And I'm just, everything is all by the flesh. It's all my planning, all, everything just going within me, and as if I've forgotten everything, and someone just threw that away, and I forgot what just happened. And if that's what happens to you, you know, it happens to Jacob, and I want you to know it's a common problem in us as Christians. And that's where Jacob is at. He went from, from being so protected by God. Now, by the way, is his plan a good one or no? Let's say he wants, he's, he's in company number two, and he wants to save himself. Do you think he could run away if he saw wanted to attack him? Huh? Huh? We don't know. Well, I'll tell you. I'll give you an idea. If you go back to Genesis 31, don't do it. Read it later. If you, don't do it right now, but do it later. If you have, if you see that when Jacob left to escape from Laban, he actually left without telling Laban, and he had a head start. You know how long was that head start? Three days. Three days head start. Did it take much for Laban to catch up to him? Nope. He caught him very fast, and he was going to hurt him. So here, that is Laban with few guys. Now, if you have Esau, and let's assume Esau is angry, and he has 400 men, do you think how long would it take to finish company number one and, get, and catch up with company? He has no way to escape. So even his plan is flawed. And many times when we face the stress of life, the difficulties, the persecutions, the troubles, we, our plan doesn't even make sense. It, it is, it's a terrible plan. And not only that, his plan is not just terrible military-wise, because he'll get caught, and he will get hurt. But second of all, he just did something terrible in his family. He said, y'all are not as important as the, other, as the other group. Because, I mean, it's not like he's in company number one. Jacob loves me, myself, and I. Jacob always takes care of himself. You know, he was afraid. He said, I am sure my brother is angry. I am sure my brother remembers this. Or else he wouldn't be coming with 400 men. I'm sure my brother will hurt me. And in the word of God, in Genesis, Esau, sorry, uh, uh, Cain killed Abel. And you know, we quote the Bible sometimes. I'll read with you a verbs in Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 19. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. And here he says, listen, I, I know it's going to be really hard to win my brother. And especially when my brother was so angry that he says, a brother offended. If I offend my brother, someone really close to me, that's harder to win than a strong city. It'd be easier to go. I mean, is it easy to win a strong city? Not at all. He says, that is much easier than to win my brother whom I offended. He says, it's kind of like this. It's, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. It's like fights, but it's like you're fighting with a, a bar of a castle. Can you break a bar of a castle? Can you do anything to it? No, you can't. He says, and that's what I'm facing. I'm facing Esau, who I know is angry with me. I know he did not forget what happened 20 years ago. He had wanted to kill me then. I'm sure he wants to kill me now. And it's going to be impossible for me to win this. And we say things and things and things. So what does he do? He prays. And I want you to know, man, even though Esau is not a good symbol of the best believer, but this prayer is probably the best prayer, one of the best prayers in all of the Bible. It is one of the most powerful, one of the most amazing prayers. 
This shows that not only does he know how to pray, but he knows the heart of God. And not only does he know the heart of God, but he also knows God's will in his life. And man, he's weak. He's a weak believer, yet he understands this, this amazingness of how God is and who God is. So, let's get into the prayer. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. First, as he says, oh, I'm approaching you. And I want you to remember something, God, that there's a covenant. And you're a God of a covenant. When you give a covenant, it's it. It's set. That is it. It is set in stone. So he started with Abraham and Isaac, his grandpa and his father. He says, don't look at me. I'm weak. But you, you gave that promise, that covenant to my grandpa. That's where it started. You gave that same covenant, the same exact one to my father, and you gave it to me, Lord. So I want you to know I'm relying on your covenant. So he reminds God of his covenant. Second, the Lord who said to me, he says, now I'm going to take your word and I'm going to quote your word, Lord. This is not just a general saying, but this is a specific saying that you said to me. Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. Not only does he remind God of his covenant, but he reminds God of his specific promises to him. Reminds God of his word to him. Now, I want to tell you, uh, let's just go back a little bit real quickly. If you go Genesis 28. Just a few pages back. Genesis 28, verse 15. Behold, here God is speaking to him, and this is when he had run away 20 years ago. Behold, I am with you and will keep you, or I'm going to protect you, wherever you go, okay? And will bring you back to this Land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. This is God speaking to him, telling him his promise that I'm going to, I'm with you, but I'm also not just with you, I'm going to protect you. So your safety is going to, is guaranteed. It's on me. I'm going to protect you, but not just protect you, but I'm going to bring you back. You're not going to live there forever. You're coming back home. And um, back to this land, for I will not leave you. I'm never going to leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Meaning, you've got my promise, and my promise is a guarantee, and this will happen. That you have me with you, and you have me to protect you. But also, I'm not just with you, but I'm never leaving you. Wow. Okay, and Jacob remembers this. I'll tell you. He just told God. You're the one that told me. Look, now go to Genesis 31, verse 3. Genesis 31.3, this is when he had, he, Laban, uh, well, let me just show you what Laban looked like. Verse 1, now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, so this is his brothers-in-law, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all this wealth. Jacob ripped our dad off, and they're not happy with him. And Jacob saw, so not only were they talking among themselves, but Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, meaning the way Laban looked at him. And indeed, it was not favorable toward him as before. He's like, <laughs> Jacob, you know, like that. Not favorable at all. Then the Lord, verse 3, said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. I'm still promising. I'm still with you. Yeah, he doesn't look at, he's not happy with you. He's not, his countenance toward you is not very favorable, but I'm going to be with you. So here he said to him that what, who's the one that commanded Jacob to go back? Who said to Jacob to go back? God is the one that told him, right? The Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, right? 
So he says, I want you to go not just to that land, but I want you to go specifically to your family. And I'm going to be with you. I'm right there with you along the way. Let's skip to verse 13. And you hear God is speaking to Jacob again. He says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar. Remember chapter 28? That's me. I'm that same God where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. You took a promise. You made a promise for me, and I don't forget your promises, Jacob. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Here, twice in the same chapter, he says, I want you to go home. It's me commanding you, and I am with you on your way. Now, if you go, I said he had a three-day head start, right? In the three-day head start, look at what happened in verse 24. So finally, Laban caught up with him. But God had come to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night. So this is the, the night before Laban was going to finally meet uh, Jacob face to face. And what did God do? And said to him, so here God intervenes. He comes in the middle and he has a personal talk with Laban. Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So here, what is God telling Laban? He's telling him, shush. I don't want you to talk to Jacob. I don't want you to say something good. I don't want you to say something bad. I just want you to shh, shush. I don't want to hear it from you. Now, do you think God can scare people? Oh, yeah. You think Laban was scared? Oh, I think his knees were knocking. So Laban overtook Jacob. So now he caught up with him. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you have stolen away unknown to me? Why would you leave without telling and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword. It's like, you didn't even ask my daughters. You just took them. But that's not really what happened. Why did you flee away secretly? Why did you leave without telling me, man? And steal away from me and not tell me. I wish you would have told me. For I might have sent you away with joy and songs. With timbrel and harp. Uh -huh. You really think he was going to do that? No, he wanted to kill him. He wanted to hurt him, right? He said, oh, why did you leave without telling me? I might have. That's what, That's after God talked to him. He was scared of Jacob. He's like, man, I, could, I wanted to sing you a song with timbrel and the harp. I even know, I don't know how to play it, but I was going to learn for you, you know. And, and I was going to be so joyous because God was going to kill me for messing with you. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. And then the real Laban comes out, verse 29, it is in my power to do you harm. That's really what he wanted to do. He wanted to hurt him. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor You see, it's easy for us to blame Jacob. To say, seriously, Jacob, you ran away. God gave you his promise, said, Jacob, I'm going to be with you. And I'm bringing you back home. And your safety is guaranteed. Then real life safety check. He says, Jacob, go home twice. And he says, I'm going to be with you in the same chapter. Jacob finally has the guts to actually leave. Then he leaves. Laban comes to meet him, and he finds out that God met Laban before Laban met Jacob. And God told, Jake, God told Laban, I don't want you to speak good or bad to him. And then Laban gave you a front and then told you the truth, that he was going to hurt you. But he said, I can't touch you because God's hand is over you. Because God has protected you. And then he walks out of that, right? Genesis 32, verse 1, what we read. So Jacob went on his way, and guess who he meets? And the angels of God met him. God is here, is really present in his life. And God, is his angels are present in his life. And Jacob saw them, and then he found out that they're not just a little bit of angels. They're two camps of angels. And he's surrounded by God's protection. But once he meets reality, he forgets everything. 
Once he meets reality, he lets go of that faith, that trust. Not only faith and trust, but evidence, absolute evidence that God is with him in his life. And he lives that weak Christian life, not according to the calling by which he was called. So back to Genesis 32 and verse uh, 9, we've seen that he quoted God's covenant. He quoted what God's words, what God told him to do. He says, God, I am, I am actually in your will right now. God, I'm actually following your command. I'm doing exactly what you told me. You told me to leave Laban. I left Laban. You told me to come home, and I'm coming home, and look at what's happening to me. That's number two. So here, I'm quoting your covenant, and I am doing your will. I am following your orders. I'm actually being obedient this time. Third thing, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. And here, there's like a... a, a what do they call it? You know, when your life passes before you, you see a film. And then he had this miraculous thing where he sat there and he said, God, you're amazing. And then he says, he looked at mercy after mercy after mercy after mercy. And he says, none of these are my mercies, like because of anything in me. Mercy is what I don't get what I deserve. And he says, Lord, this is all you. This is you being merciful with me. And then he says, I am not worthy. And here is honest, sincere humility from him. I am not worthy, not of these mercies, no, of the least of all the mercies. So go, I, here's the mild, your mercies. Okay, uh, I think that's the least one. I'm not even worthy of that one. He saw God protecting him from Laban. He saw God taking an impossible situation. A guy who's a runaway. And look at what he says here. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff. All I had was a little stick. And now I have become two companies. I've become an army. You know who met him? Angels as what? Two companies, Mahanaim. And it's as if God is telling him, Jacob, I'm watching over you. Jacob, how, how many are you? Oh, we're two companies. And oh, by the way, how many angels do I have there? Two companies. One for one. Do you know what one angel can do? Jacob. Jacob. And here Jacob says, Lord, you're so good. Lord, you're an amazing God. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve how good you are to me. And I just, mercy after mercy, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I just, I don't know what to do. And uh, the least of them, and I can't even call any of them the least, I'm not worthy of it. Lord, you're so good to me. And I really pray that we do this sometimes. It's rather than focusing on what we don't have or what he said no to. Just focus on how many yeses he has done and all the mercies he has done. And you're going to find that it's because of his mer mercies that he had said all these other no's in my life. But I'm just like, it's this thing, Lord. I just, really, that's my obsession. And then from there, he says, okay, I'm going to be honest with you, Lord. I'm going to be very specific with what I'm asking in this prayer. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him. And I think this has got to be the first time ever that Jacob was ever honest with himself and honest with God. He always lies. He always puts a twist on it. But he says, I'm going to be honest. I want deliverance. And I want deliverance from my brother. And here's why. I'm afraid of him. For I am afraid. For I fear him. And then he says... That's my specific request, but I'm going to go back to you and your goodness. Do you see how he knows God? He knows how to pray. 
He knows God's heart. And he says, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. And for the first time, he doesn't just think about Jacob. He thinks about his children. He thinks about his, about his wife. He thinks about his, his wives. He says, Lord, I don't want people to get hurt. Yes, I don't want to get hurt, but I also don't want them to get hurt. Because this goes back not just to being hurt. Because I want you to remember, Lord, your promises. Look at the next verse. He says, for you said, I will surely treat you well. That was your promise to me. It's not that you're just going to treat me. You're going to treat me well. And not just treat me well, but surely treat me well. And make your descendants as the sand of the sea. That's what? Sand of the sea is a lot. You can't count it. And that's going to be my descendants. is going to be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude, just in case you didn't know what that is. In my calculation, that's a lot of people. And if he kills them, if he kills me, your promise. You keep your promise, Lord, right? You guys remember the songs in the morning? It was about what? Faith, but God's promises. Okay, remember the message from the morning? Faith and God's promises and trusting God. The message right now is faith, God's promises. And that's what he did here. He says, Lord, I'm praying to you. And I'm praying the right way. With a heart of humility. And I'm going to tell you that it's, see, Lord, it's about you. It's about your glory. You wouldn't just let your child go like that. You're the one that promised me. If something happens to me, that means you didn't keep your promise. But you're a good God. And he takes him at his word. He says, I'm actually, for the first time ever, in obedience to you. I am here because you want me here. And I am coming home because you want me to come home. You told me twice. It took twice from you to actually get me to move to come here. But now I am coming to face my past. I'm coming to face something I did 20 years ago. I'm coming to face Esau. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. So we've seen a powerful encounter with the Lord, right? He saw two camps of angels, God encouraging him, telling him, listen, I just saved you from Laban, and I'm with you, I'm walking with you. And then we saw him, okay, now I have to face reality. That's what we think. It's like, I mean, his presence is one thing, and outside is reality. And so he goes with reality, and he totally blows it. He says, uh, I need to, you go and then tell him. And they came, oh, he's coming with 400. And he's like, okay, now I get on my knees. Now I'm going to go to this church thing, the God thing, my room thing. And then he did it, what? Out of crisis. His prayer was a powerful prayer, but it was a prayer in crisis. And there's nothing wrong with that. The best prayers come when we're in the time of crisis. And his prayer is a powerful and, and sincere and real prayer. Right when he's done, he gets done with his prayer that is so amazing, knows the heart of God. And talks to God about his goodness and his mercies and all these things. And he means it. And then he's done praying. And what does he do? He starts working on the present for his brother Esau. Does this sound like us, guys? We give him so many promises. Lord, I give you my life. I'm going to live for you. And then, ah, well, I like it. I will not be afraid. I will trust in you. Like, yeah, really, I'm scared, man. We talk big many times in his presence. And then it goes away. Look at what he does. Look at what his present is to his brother. 200. I'm going to see how good you guys are at math and how, how awake you are. Okay. How many animals does he have with him? 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes. And it's not like, ew, it's nasty. No, 
that means female sheep, just in case, <laughs> and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows, and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 foals. Foals are little donkeys. How many animals? Close, but no. Sorry, man. Huh? You're further. I said he's close. He said 550, 370. Anyway. Around 600. Tina? 580. Ah, she beat you. Sorry. Tina gets the credit on this one. 580, but you're right. Five, did you use a calculator? No? Okay, good. 580. I want to ask you guys, I know there's some experts in the room. If you wanted to, like, an average price for a cat, how much is a cat? I said average. Don't get technical on me. Like 40 bucks. How about a dog? 100 bucks? That sounds a good, like a good price. Okay. You think a donkey is... Well, let me, let me name these things, right? Tell me if these are more expensive than cats and dogs. Um, female goats? Yeah, more. Thank you, Danny. Stay with me on this one, okay? Male goats? More or less? Than, than dogs and cats. No, I agree with you, it's more. More, right? Okay, how about uh, ewes, female sheep? More. Rams? More. Camels? Okay, and then the, the, with their colts, meaning that they're baby camels? More. And then how about uh, cows? Bulls? Donkeys? Baby donkeys? More. Thank you. Very good. Let's assume in today's age that each animal is worth $100. 500 580 times 100 is 580,000. Thank you, 58,000. That's that's obviously that's a way underestimate because each one of these Animals is worth a lot more. His gift to his brother is 58,000. I hope my brother's paying attention in the back because that's his older brother. <laughs> Just kidding. 58,000. What's his purpose behind him? It's not from the goodness of his heart. He wants to buy his brother out. He wants to buy his brother's acceptance. If you don't believe me, let's read a little bit more. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself. A drove meaning he split them into three camps. I'll tell you, I'll show you that in a second. So, and he split all those 580 over that uh, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. There's three droves, three groups. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Do you see how he's like, he's been like, he went from like complete faith in the Lord and an amazing prayer. Now he's like, okay, now it's action time, okay? Now it's real life. So here, I got 580. That's just his gift. The guy's filthy rich. Right? If that's his gift, he's got a lot more. So here he's sending all these things. He says, I need you to go into three groups. And here's what, when my brother meets you, he even told him the three questions his brother's going to ask. How, the guy is like, he's a mastermind in, in planning. No wonder his name is Jacob, right? What does Jacob mean? The one who trips others, the one who deceives, the one who conniving, you know, something along those lines, right? So here he says, so when your brother, my brother asks this, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, he's not going to look and be like, oh, no, he's going to ask some questions. To whom do you belong? Question number one, where are you going? And who is already in front of you? Here's what you answer. Then you shall say, they are your servant, Jacob's. Forgot his place in the presence of God again. It is a present to my Lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. Pause here for a second. Let's go to Genesis 27. 
verse 29. This is the blessing, part of the blessing that Jacob told Jacob. Uh, sorry, that uh, Isaac told Jacob. Let peoples serve you. You're not going to serve anybody. They're going to serve you. And nations bow down to you. Who's going to bow down? Nations. That's countries. Wow. He's really important. Be master over your brethren. So what's that? Your brothers and sisters, you are their master. Not only that, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Who's his mother's sons? His name is Esau. He's supposed to bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. Let anyone dare talk bad about you. And they're cursed. And blessed be those who bless you. Anyone who says anything good about you, it is going to be in their favor. Back to Genesis 32. Here he's telling them this. He's Lord, I am servant. And actually in the next chapter, which we don't have time, he bows down before his brother. Exactly the opposite of his position, what God has given him. This is a symbol of us not living with the power and the authority of God because we don't have faith. We don't trust in God. We pray faith. faith we speak faith. We're really well in church. But then outside, it's the same old thing. No power behind our life. So he commanded the second, the third. So here he had, what, three groups? And all who followed the droves, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. So it's 580 divided by 3. And then he's going to meet three groups of people. And each group of people, he told them, you say the same exact message. I'm hoping to, that he will get the hint by the time he gets to me. And also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, here he tells us exactly what is in his heart. What is his motive? We don't have to guess it because we can't know people's motives. He says, I will appease him. Meaning I'm going to pacify him. You know what pacifier is? Like a pacifier? You know, like a kid. Ah! I just want to make him quiet. I want to appease him. I want to buy him out. With the present that goes before me. I didn't give him the present because I want to give him a present. I want to appease him. I want him to be quiet. I want him to not hurt me. That goes before me. And afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. I want to be acceptable. How many times, guys, do we as believers know exactly what it is that God wants us to do and how he wants us to live? Yet when we face the world and the ladder that we're trying to climb, and we throw that down the drain, we want to appease, we want to be acceptable. And in it, our walk is not a walk that is worthy by the calling by which we were called. How many times have we done that because we think someone may laugh at us, may make fun of us, we may not be part of the cool crowd? That's what Jacob did. And if you feel like Jacob, meaning my life is high spiritually, but then down, like really fast, there's no transition. I pray big and I mean it from my heart, and I'm very sincere, but then it's weak. No power. I live more worldly than the worldly people. If that's how you and I feel, the Lord wants to meet you at this time. And this is when the Lord comes in. He says, I see your heart and I know it's sincere. But see, you're missing something. You're missing a personal meeting with me. You're missing an interaction with me. You're missing a touch from me in your life so that you can now be empowered to live that life that you so desire, yet you can't. You're stuck in Romans chapter 7, that all that which I desire, I do not do. Woe, O oh wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body? I want to live for God, but I don't. And I know I mean it, but I don't. Well, the Lord wants to meet us tonight at this time. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, because Benjamin wasn't born yet, 
and crossed over the ford of Jabuk. So finally, he gets them somewhere, and God says, but this I have to do with you alone, just you and me. This transformation has to be personal, has to be unique, has to be one-on-one, -on -one, has to be just for you. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. Now God says, now I'm ready to work in you. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So here, who came to who? Who came to who? Jacob came or the man came? The man came. And that's the thing. Sometimes we're so weak, we don't even know. We, we know what we desire, but we can't live it. Well, don't. You know, God is going to put you alone. But he's going to come to you because he knows what's in your heart. And he wants to meet you and he wants that life to turn from power on paper, power in the desires, to power in action, to power in life. So here he came and he wrestled with him. God is amazing, guys. He comes and he meets us where we're at in the way that we are. And he knows how to meet us the right way. It's really, I love, if you look at here, he, made, he met Jacob as a what? God was in the, in the symbol of what? Andrew, please tell me. He met him as a what? This is a hint if I called out your name. Wrestler. Caught you off guard. He met him as a wrestler. Because see, Jacob, he's what? He's a wrestler at heart. Not that kind of wrestling. He's Jacob. He's the one who deceives. He's the one who trips people up. So God says, you wrestle. The only way for me to deal with you is to wrestle. Abraham was different. Was Abraham a wrestler? He wasn't a wrestler. Abraham was a traveler. So what did God, how did God meet him? As a traveler. He came by and he saw him passing. He's like, wait, 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 come here. Joshua was neither a traveler nor a wrestler. Joshua was a warrior. So what did he meet him? As a soldier. And God wants to meet you where you're at, in the way that you are. Because he wants to transform. He wants to cause a change. And so here, the only thing that would work for Jacob is Jacob. The only thing that would work for a wrestler is another wrestler, but a more trained, more skilled wrestler who can change him and transform him. And so here God comes as a wrestler, and he says, it says here that, um, that a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. That is a long match. What is an average match of wrestling? Help me out on this, Andrew. Six minutes, see? See, how long was this match? All night. That's exhausting. Six minutes for a wrestler. After that, you have to rest for a long time before you could do your second match. Right? Can you go into six minutes and then do another six minutes and then another six minutes? You can't do that. You'd be, you'd be putting yourself to, what? to fail. Because even if you're strong, you're so worn out that the next person could beat you. It could be someone weaker. Not even in your weight class can take you down. And here, this tells us that that Jacob is not just Jacob, he's real Jacob. Meaning he's not just a wrestler, he's a really good wrestler. And he persevered, he kept, he kept God's trying to like, I need to break you, Jacob. And Jacob was like, no, I still, my flesh wants to come out. My flesh wants to be part of this. And he kept going all night until the breaking of the day. Now it's like about, the sun is about to come out. And then now when he, this is the Lord, saw that he did not prevail. He is capital, meaning God did not prevail. So who's the one not winning against him? Him, cap, uh, uh, lowercase h. Who's the one that saw that this match is not getting anywhere and I'm not winning? Who's the one talking right now? God. God is saying, I can't beat him. I can't defeat Jacob. I can't get, get him off of me. And the guy won't let go. He doesn't get exhausted. And God says, listen, the day is coming. Let me go. So then finally, God said, I, I have to do something. He touched the socket of his hip. Another wording is he struck. All he needs is a touch. He's really powerful. Touched the socket of his hip. What happened? And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So here, what happened to him? He, he has, he, what happened to his hip? What's the medical term? It's not broken. Dislocated. 
thank you. We got to speak medically correct, you know. <laughs> There's medical people listening. It's dislocated. Anyone here ever have a dislocated hip? Not a dislocated anything else, dislocated hip. Oh, it is really painful. Not just is it painful, it's really hard to reset, okay? So I've done it once, I've tried actually. I've tried once or twice when I was in residency. And you have to put the person under what we call conscious sedation. So this is just to relax their body because they, you can't get them to fight you and it is extremely painful. And then you wrap a, a little towel around you because you'll fall if you don't do it. And you need to use all your weight and then you basically like drop yourself and you try and you hope it happens and even then most of the time it doesn't happen. So I failed. Couldn't do it. I had to call someone bigger than I. Plus I didn't want to get hurt, man. It's like, hey, someone else could do this. It is extremely painful. It can make the strongest of men cry like a baby. Another name for this that people call it is a sciatica. Anyone here knows what sciatica is? Oh, when a sciatica is really inflamed, I'm telling you, you can't walk, you can't talk, you can scream only. It's extremely painful. But the crazy thing is, so Jacob has a dislocated hip, and God dislocated it. Why? Because he wants to end the match. Did the match end? No. Who's still holding on to God? Jacob. Who's still wrestling? Jacob, he is one powerful guy. But we found out now there's something good about Jacob. Because there's the motive behind why Jacob is not willing to lose this match to God. He says, God, I'm going to wrestle with you. I'm going to win you. Anyone here crazy enough to try to do that with God? Wow, that's pretty awesome. I'm, I wouldn't mess with God, but Jacob did. Well, God came to him and he says, thank you for coming. I accept your match and I'm not going down on this one. And God dislocated his hip, and he still did not let go. And it says, and what? Was out of joint, right? Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. He still wrestled with God. He wouldn't let go. The pain didn't stop him. The dislocation, the inability to move. I mean, one leg is like this, you know, it's like dragging. And he's still wrestling with God. And he said, finally, God is like, I don't know what to do with this guy. I can't get him off of me. He says, let me go. This is God speaking. Why? For the day breaks. I'm tired. The day breaks, let me go. Obviously, God didn't say I'm tired. I'm just being expressive. But he said, and, and Jacob, with all boldness and with all his pain and this location, he says, I will not let you go unless you do one thing for me. Unless you bless me, exclamation mark. Okay, let's be honest. We saw Jacob's gift. Is it expensive or not? Really expensive. So if that's a gift, that means he has a lot more or not? Yes. Is he wealthy or not? Okay, when he said, Lord, I am not worthy of the least of your mercies. And then what was his example? One of the examples that he gave is what? I crossed over with a staff, and I'm back now with what? Two camps. I'm filthy rich. Did God bless him or not? Yes. Did God keep his end of the bargain or not? Yes. He told him, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to bring you back. But he didn't take him just and brought him back. He brought him back really filthy rich. He gave him blessing. That was blessing in those days. If you look at Jacob's, uh, uh, Isaac's blessing to Jacob, it's all financial. It's all tangible stuff. But Jacob says, uh-uh, I want to be blessed. You've been blessed. No, I haven't. You see, he has insight. He says there's something deeper than money. There's something deeper than status, than titles, than degrees. And that is that I am pleasing to you. I live my life wanting to please people. I live my life, I'm rich, and I'm using my riches to buy people off. But I want you to bless me. I want that personal true blessing. I want that thing that you gave Abraham. I want that thing that you gave Isaac that I know I don't have. I want true blessing. I don't want money. I don't want riches. I want to feel that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to experience the Holy Spirit. I want to experience the filling of the Holy Spirit. I want to experience you in my life. I want to experience you being pleased with me. I want to experience you, God, in my life. I don't want to experience me anymore. 
And that's where he fell in a place. I mean, it's ridiculous. What he's asking for is what he already has. But he says, no, that's nothing. I know I don't have you. I, don't, I know I don't have your pleasure. Yes, you watch over me. Yes, you keep your promises. Yes, you're a good God. But I feel I live in disobedience. And that's why I don't have your blessing. I want to not walk in my same way anymore. I don't want to talk big and then walk weak. I don't want to be all talk. I want to be talk and walk at the same time. I want to live for you from all my life, from all my heart. So he said to him, the Lord said to Jacob, what is your name? Does this sound like the biggest nonsense question ever? Does God know his name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? You're going to go from, uh, the guy's not going to let you go, and he's all broken up, and he says, unless you bless me, and he's like, what is your name? And Jacob said, he said, Jacob. But I want you to know it's not like that. I'm being silly. It's not like, oh, 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 what is your name? Jacob. That's not what happened. You see, Jacob, the last time he was really asked his name, he lied about it to his dad. What God was really asking him is, do you know who you really are? Because unless, I could, unless you know who you really are, I can't change you. Unless you know your problem, I can't change you. Can you be honest with yourself now and tell me who it is that you are so I can bless you? And Jacob was said, yes, I'm willing, Lord. I'm going to be honest. I am Jacob. I'm a deceitful, conniving, lying person. And I don't want to be Jacob anymore. I'm tired of the way I've been living. I want your blessing. I want my life to not just be hopes and desires, but to be hopes and desires with a life, living those hopes and desires. And he said, you got me, Lord. You know, if you ever seen the Lord with the Samaritan woman, he said to her, he went, right? They were going back and forth. And he says, listen, bring me your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. Touche. Clever. I like it. She gave a safe answer that gave no answer and didn't really lie. She wasn't married at the moment. But Jesus did not allow that one to, to slide by. And he says, in that you spoke the truth. Because you had five other husbands and you're living with a guy right now who's not your husband. And she's like, oh, he's asking me my name. So she wanted to weasel, you know, wiggle out of it. She said, I see you're a prophet. Where do we worship? Uh-uh, no philosophical talks. Unless you're ready to meet yourself, I can't change you. Unless you're ready to be honest with yourself, I can't change you. Jacob did not pull a Samaritan woman. He said, Jacob, I'm tired of me, Lord. And verse 28, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. I'm going to change that, which you're tired of. Now it makes sense why he changed his name, right? Because he says you're no longer a deceiver because you're ready to confess your sin. You're ready to allow me to move in your life. And this is, guys, this is, I'm talking to believers, not unbelievers. This is to believers. Sometimes it's that one thing, that sin or that thing that keeps us from going forward with the Lord. And he says that we shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And Israel, no one really knows for sure what the exact meaning is. Some people uh, think it's prince with God. 
but some people think it's the same exact statement that comes after. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. You wrestled, but you won the battle. What does that mean? Another word for that is you're victorious now. Either you're prince with God, or now you're going to live the life of victory. No more lies. No more Jacob, but victory. And you know, when you have a new name, in the word of God, when Jesus or God changes someone name, someone's name, what that means, it's a new beginning. And sometimes we need that fresh start, that new beginning, that hope. And God wants to do that. Come to him and allow him to change your name from whatever it is that's been troubling you so long and allow him to take you, to take you on the waters. You know, spirit lead me where, my, without, where the trust is without borders. So God did amazing things. So first, he had to break him. And he saw that he still insisted on the blessing. Then he told him, I'm going to give you a new start. I'm going to change your name. I'm going to make you victorious. I'm going to make you prince. I'm going to exalt you. And I'm going to seat you in the heavenlies. Isn't that what he's done with us as believers? But God didn't stop there. And Jacob, um, then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him. And they're here basically saying, I want to know you. Okay. But, you know, now it's breaking of day. And then what it says that, why is it that you ask about my name? He knows why. He wants to know him. But then it was, and he blessed him there. He gave him the real blessing that he's been waiting for, not the money that he's had. Sorry. He got the blessing of God. Then, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. And uh, Peniel means face of God. The name of, uh, of the place Penuel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. He said, I got more than what I dreamed of. I saw angels. I saw two camps of angels, but now I saw God face to face. I got a different encounter with the Lord where I've seen him face to face. I talked to him. I struggled with him. I wrestled with him. And I said, no, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And I didn't die. I got to see God face to face, and we need to be broken. We need that 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 pride, that Jacobness, whatever it is for you and me, to be broken. Then there's a new start, but not just a new start. There's a new vision. Now I can see the Lord in my life, and I can see His blessing upon me in my life. God face to face, and then uh, just as He crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Third thing. His walk now was what? Different. He changed his name. He changed how he sees things. It's Penuel now. And he changed the way he walks. Is his walk a strong walk or a walk of someone who's weak? Someone, huh? Thank you. He's limping. That is not a strong walk. What is that? Well, if you open 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul, when he realized that, okay, Satan buffeting me, that's your will, and that makes me weak, but it's, your strength shows up more, Lord, he says, okay, I've done my math done my calculation, and here's my conclusion. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Jacob, you can't walk with your own strength by your flesh anymore. You have to walk relying on me. You have to be limping. You have to trust in me. You have to know that that weakness of yours, my strength shows up more. You no longer can lead yourself you no longer, if you really want to be Israel, if you want to have victory, you can't run your own life now. You can't lead your own life. You can't be in charge of your own life. Isn't that what Jesus did with Peter? When he said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? 
And then he says, well, when you grow older, since you said, I know that I love you. When you grow older, someone will lead you to where you do not want. Now you're going to have to glorify me through your life, but not just with your life, even with your death. Do you want to be changed? Are you tired of these amazing prayers without a life? God wants to wrestle with us tonight. God wants to take us, change our name. But he wants to know what is our real name right now. Will we be willing to be honest with him? And if we are, he's willing to change us. Do we want his blessing really bad? We need to be broken before him. and He will break us, but only to heal us so that we can walk differently, so we can see things differently, and we can have victory in our life. Israel, victory. Limping, walking by his strength. I can't. Isn't that what Philippians 2 says? That he is the one who what wills to do and to will in your life. You can't do it. If you're trying, you are stuck in two places. Romans 7 and Jacob who prays amazing prayers, the life is weak. But if you're ready to allow him to walk, to lead you, and to, that you follow him, he's ready to bless you. You know the crazy thing? We don't have time for him ending right now. But if you look at the next chapter, he meets Esau. And the thing is, if you guys know the story of the prodigal son, you know, prodigal son, you know, the guy that had two sons. And one of them said, Dad, I want all my money, my inheritance, even though you're alive. I want my inheritance. I want to take off. And I just want it. He took it, stayed it for a little bit. Oh, let me be polite. And then took off. Wasted it all. When he comes back, he found out that his father was actually looking for him and waiting for him. And then his father ran toward him and kissed him. And then he says, hey, cut the, catted, the, the fatted calf and put the ring on him, the robe, and let's celebrate him. I want you to know, Esau was like the father and the prodigal son in the next part. He saw him, and the one who ran toward the other was Esau. Esau ran toward Jacob, and he hugged him, and they cried. Jacob told Esau, well, he's like, what is all this stuff? He's like, oh, it's a gift. He says, no, my brother. I have enough. He's content. A sinner is content. He says, I have enough. Keep it. And Jacob's like, please take it. Please take it. He's like, no, no, my brother, just take your stuff. And he insisted that he's like, he didn't know what else to do, so he accepted the gift. That was the story. Does this mean that Esau forgave his brother or not? Yes. Did he need the gift to forgive him? No. Did he need all that cunning and planning and all these things? No. So all the drama of chapter 32, was it necessary? No. He jumped to conclusions. They were all incorrect. 400 men, he must be wanting to kill me. He's coming to welcome him. And you know the sad thing, guys, is many times we in our lives jump into conclusions that are nothing but as far away from the truth as what it is. But it sounds convincing. It sounds very logical. I mean, 20 years. But you know what the other thing is? A sinner was able to forgive what is hard to forgive, right? We read, you guys remember Proverbs? That it's really hard for a brother to offend a brother and to heal that. It's harder than taking a strong city. It's like beating on the castle. It's like against castle bars. But a sinner forgave his brother who took away the most precious thing that he can and he wept bitterly about it. Do we forgive each other? It's a deep story and it talks about life talks about sometimes sinners live more godly lives than us, even though they're not going to heaven. So I want to conclude with a few things. Have you seen the Lord? Have you tasted the Lord? If so, 
Why is it that we keep walking a weak life after it? We encounter abundance of God's presence, two camps of angels, yet we start plotting and planning and coming to conclusions that are not true. And in it, we've exposed ourselves is that we have favorites. That's my favorite kid. That's my favorite wife. That's my favorite this. That's my favorite servant. Y'all are in the first. We're in the second. If you die, let us know so we can run away. I mean, really? It's so sad. The second thing is, do we pray? And if the answer is yes, amen, because God hears it. Do we know God's heart when we pray? And many times we do, and we pray right, and we pray sincerely. But why is it that we go straight from that prayer straight to plotting right after? The reason is, like I shared with you guys, Romans 7, oh, who can save me from this wretched flesh? And you know what the next part says? Thank God for Jesus Christ. That's the ending of Romans 7. But you know what Romans 8 talks about? The Holy Spirit. Meaning the only person that can save me from me is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he can make me see Jesus and make me look like Jesus. First Corinthians chapter 3, the last verse, it says that we behold his face with, with, uh, we behold with unveiled face that we are, as in a mirror, we're changing into his glory by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can change us and transform us. So if you are stuck, if we are stuck in this amazing prayers, but the life doesn't add up, why don't you allow the wrestler to come to you? Why don't you sit alone and allow him to come? It might hurt. No, it will hurt. But are you desperate for him? Are you desperate for his blessing? Come to him and allow him to bless you. Allow him to give you a new start. Allow him to give you a new name. Allow him to let you walk differently. Now, now you're empowered. You're weak, but you're empowered by his power. You're limping, but he's walking for you. Now you're seeing things through his eyes. Give me your eyes for just, not just one second, but give me your eyes throughout my life. I want to see people through you. I want to see the lost world and have love for people. I want to see believers and have love for them and pray for them and have my heartbreak for them and lift them up. But now the other thing I want to leave us with, how many things are conclusions jumped into and we cause pain and agony for everybody around us? He caused pain for his family. He caused pain for himself. And it was for nothing. But the last thing, how about forgiveness? Esau forgave him. And he thought he wasn't forgiven. The problem did not lie with Esau. The problem lied with Jacob. Because I think Jacob didn't forgive himself. And Jacob knew he wasn't walking the straight and narrow. That's why he couldn't walk that life. That's why he had that guilt of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. There's two types of, of two types of conviction. One is from God that leads me to repentance, and that's it, and I get back up. But there's another one that looks just like it, and it's from Satan, that leads me to beat myself up and then beat myself up and not forgive myself, and I can't go forward in my walk. Jacob was stuck in that one. I really pray that we forgive ourselves, but I really pray that we forgive others. You know, there's churches, you always hear stories, people, 20 years, you know, one person will sit on this side, the other one will sit on that side. Why? Because that person sits on this side, and I'm sitting there because that person sits on that side. We had a, this church before. Why? One person stole the other person's money, their whole wealth. And they were a very rich person, and all their wealth was gone. They have had a hard time taking communion. May God free us. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's a lot better to 
to live victorious, to live Israel. It's not worth it. Because just as Christ, right? Ephesians 4, 32. Forgive one another. Not enough to stop there. Just as Christ forgave us. Just as God forgave us in Christ Jesus. The same way that Christ forgave us. We are bigger, bigger criminals to him than we are to each other. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer, and if anyone wants to pray out loud. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're troubled by the ups and downs. The heart's desires are good, but maybe not the walk. Maybe you need Penuel to see the Lord's face, to see his goodness. Are we thankful? Do we feel upset and complain and we feel, why me? Or do we feel that I am unworthy of the least of your mercies, as Jacob said? Have we forgiven? Are we willing to change, to have a fresh start, a new name full of victory? Because we walk weak, but strong by his strength. Do we see people through Jesus Christ? If anyone wants to pray out loud.